You're probably beginning to think that backstage at Disney's is just one problem after another, and that making films can be a mammoth headache. Well, fortunately, there comes a time when all the problems have been foreseen, addressed, and taken care of. And that's the actual filming. They're doing a new CBS television series called Zorro and Son today on the back lot. The episode is called The Butcher of Barcelona. So instead of more questions and problems, I thought you might enjoy seeing some of the glamour and excitement. And who has a more easygoing and fun-filled life than the leading man? And here he comes. That's Paul Regina who plays Zorro Jr. in the series. Let's just follow him around for a while and see how smooth and uncomplicated backstage at Disney's can really be. Morning. Howdy. Incidentally, Paul's fun-filled day begins at 6.30 a.m. Just one nun in distress. It's a piece of cake. If you'll forgive me, Don Carlos. Um, I didn't understand the word nun. Marori. Lady Marcus. Action. Don't worry. It's just one nun in distress. It's a piece of cake. If you'll forgive me, Don Carlos. Two Boston, take two. Yeah, you've got to get the one. I think if you make it, it's just one just nun. Just one nun in distress. Okay. All righty, here we go. Marker? Action. Don't worry, it's just one nun in distress. He's <laughs> <laughs> the case. Cauldron has been in the works for three years and is scheduled to be released in 1985. The producer, Joe Hale, has been involved with animation for over 30 years and he's agreed to give us a crash course on the makings of an animated film and all the accompanying problems. So, where do you start, Joe? The place to start with an animated feature, of course, is with the story. Uh, in the case of The Black Cauldron, we started with five books and had to condense them down into one. Uh, primarily, it's based on the Black Cauldron. And these books are from the uh, Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. Uh, one of our problems was that there were so many characters and so much story that it was kind of a case of uh, taking all of this material and condensing it into 
uh, one story that we could put on the screen. Of course, the thing that I always look for in an animated uh, film is to try to do a, a story that can't be done any other way. For instance, uh, Bambi or uh, 101 Dalmatians or Lady and the Tramp could only be done in animation. I always feel that if you can do it with real actors, then that's really the way you should do it. Uh, once we get the uh, story written in narrative form, then we start breaking it down into story sketches, and we put that on uh, four by eight storyboards, and we write the story the way you, uh, you would write a comic strip. Once the storyboard has been approved, then we uh, bring it, we start looking for voices. Uh, our voice talents, and in the case of the Black Cauldron, uh, we uh, have people not only from this country, like Jonathan Winters, who does King Idolig. Uh, we use John Hurt. Uh, most of our talent comes from England, because we felt that that would give it more of a classic uh, feeling, because the, the stories are based on a Welsh fairy tale, and uh, usually we uh, We'll try to find uh, uh, the right voice for the character, and then in many cases, then we redesign the character to fit the voice, if it's a particularly uh, good voice. Then we cut the voices in opposite those sketches, and so we can run a complete sequence with just story sketches and hear the voices played against those sketches. We start doing our rough animation. The animator comes up, he talks with the director, they discuss the scene. They sometimes they will act it out. Uh, the director tells the animator exactly what he wants to see on the screen. We see Creeper here on the steps, right at the foot of the steps here with the king, and he gets excited as what's happening, and he's building up this attitude and this expression. He's enjoying it <laughs> because he's seen the vision. The vision starting to form in the water, and, and so he's, he's going crazy. So he's, he's excited. Yeah, he's, he's overwhelmed. overwhelmed. He'd be jumping up and down, jumping up and down, like, you clapping, know, his clapping his hands, clapping his hands, going, look, 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 Something like that? Absolutely right. right. Let's go for it. The animator then takes the scene and he animates the character very roughly. Then that is brought up to the director. The director looks at the scene and if he approves it, the animator's assistant cleans up that scene in one fine pencil line so that it can be Xeroxed onto a cell. After the drawings are cleaned up, they go to the ink and paint department where they're Xeroxed onto clear cells and painted on the back. At the same time this is going on, the background department is painting the background in full color. The uh, colored cells and the painted background then go to production camera where they are shot in color. Presently we have, uh, I believe, 111 animators and assistants working on the Black Cauldron. When the film gets into ink and paint, there will probably be maybe 250 people involved. And that's all there is to it. It may sound complicated, but it really isn't. Is that you, Hen? Look what I've got. Come on out. Here's a lovely, juicy apple. <laughs> oh, great prince. Keep poor starving greedy munchings and crunchies. Nice apple. Good prince. Good apple. Oh boy, what a juicy apple. Bleed it up for dirt. Bleed it up for dirt. Hey, no you don't. I didn't give you that apple. You took it. Ow! <laughs> hey, hold on you hairy little thief. Come back with my apple. If you don't give it back, you'll be sorry. I mean it. I'm warning you. Give it back. Come on, the apple. Where is it? Uh uh. Do we not know where they are? Uh oh. Give it back. I warn you. Come on. Uh oh. Let's take a little breather. There are a couple of projects that are not here physically on the lot. One of those is entitled Never Cry Wolf. 
Some of you may remember it. It was a bestseller in the early 1960s, written by Farley Moat about a government biologist sent to research wolves in the Arctic. The director is Carol Ballard, who also did The Black Stallion. According to Mr. Ballard, the horse was a considerably easier animal to deal with than the wolf. The difficulty I found with wolves uh, doing a film involving wolves, the main difficulty is uh, they have a very, very, very short attention span and very sort of hyper animals. They're always aware, they're always looking, they're always uh, uh, alert. And to just get a shot of a wolf looking at something or looking like he's contemplating something or looking like he's thinking uh, would require sometimes a great deal of trickery. Uh, uh, we had to first engage his interest in something that actually interested him and actually he didn't know what it was in some way that would keep him looking in the same direction for at least 10 or 15 seconds, which was sometimes a day-long <laughs> proposition. To me, the, the horse, in the horse picture, the horse, it's quite easy to make a horse into a sort of a magic, mythical animal. Because, uh, I don't know, there's just something about the way they move and the way they, they are. That, but with wolves, you also have a mythical beast, but uh, they actually are so different from their reputation. There's a huge gap between the myth and the reality. It was a thing that caused me to control my difficulty in making the film because I found it very difficult to, well, I found it impossible to actually create the mythical wolf.